Hello and welcome everyone. I am Vishal Khandelwal and this is the 1% show. This show is an open-ended exploration into the minds of the wisest people around to help us learn to think, invest and live each day a little as little as 1% better. You can learn more at safalniveshak.com or vishalkhandelwal.com. My guest today is Navneet Manod, the MD and CEO of HDFC Mutual Fund. Navneet is also the chairman of the Association of Mutual Funds in India or AMFI, which is the governing body of asset management companies in India. He has over 30 years of experience in the financial markets. Before joining HDFC, Navneet worked with SBI Mutual Fund as CIO, Morgan Stanley Investment Management as Executive Director and Head of Multi-Strategy Boutique and Birla Sun Life Mutual Funds as CIO for Fixed Income and Hybrid Funds. He has a master's degree in accountancy and business statistics and is a qualified chartered accountant. Navneet is also a charter holder of the CAF Institute and CAIA Institute. Navneet is a visionary voice who has not only shaped the landscape of investment in India over the years, but also stands as a testament to the power of perseverance and insight. From very humble beginnings, he has carved a path that many only dared to dream of, embodying the very essence of determination and great foresight. His story is not just one of financial acumen, but of inspiring a generation to look beyond the apparent and strive for long-term success. Today, he joins us to share his insights, experiences, and vision for the future of investing in India. With this and no further delay, Navneet, I welcome you to The 1% Show and thank you so much for taking out time from your busy schedule to do do this. Thank you, Vishal, for having me and thank you for that uh, great introduction. <laughs> I don't think I deserve all of that, uh, and but but it's an honor to be here. I've seen some of the other thought leaders, other you know outstanding investors who've been part of this show before. So it's indeed a great pleasure and an honor to be to be part of this. Thank you so much. And over the years, I mean, I've read you, I've followed you, and I've deep respect for the service that you have been doing. Um, in terms of my background, so yeah, it's very humble and it's very rich. Uh, humble in a sense that I was born in a, born brought up in, in a small town, a place called uh, Bhavar. It's in Rajasthan. It used to be an Ajmer district. Now Bhavar is a district uh, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a business town. And we all were like in the family, joint family was in some small businesses. My father uh, wasn't keeping well from a health perspective. But he was like a man with a with lot of curiosity and deep interest in, in everything in life, everything in the world. And maybe I think he inculcated this, this habit of, of reading, of knowing, he used to use the sentence, read more, meet more. And of course, I mean, we are in a small town. I hardly traveled, if I remember correctly. I think outside Rajasthan, I had traveled to Ahmedabad, I had traveled to Indore in MP, and I had traveled to Delhi. Other than that, till I did my C, I hadn't seen any part of the country. <laughs> Forget about the rest of the world. And after that, I've, I've traveled a lot across the world. But the, the initial years were like in that small town largely. Uh, <clears throat> my teachers were, were very kind to me. Uh, I did uh, my schooling from a school named Sri Shanti Jain Madhyamik Vidyalaya, Hindi medium. Uh, and then the Sanatan Dharma Rajkiya Mahavidyalaya, the, the only college that we had and did my CA from a firm like local CA from KC Doshan Company and all of them were so kind to me, all my teachers, all these years. I wasn't too much into sports, but I think other than that, most of the other extracurricular activities that one can think of, I was part of them and most of the teachers, in fact, several of them are still in touch with me. And I, I feel very privileged for for their to have their blessings all these years. Not only in my when I was studying, but but even now. <laughs> in family, we had many uh, small small businesses. Uh, we didn't have to interact with the world, but as I said, that my father a lot of curiosity. And these were the days where he, I mean, if you want an English newspaper that would come on second or third day, and it used to be costly. If I remember in in eighties, economic times used to be. Uh, priced at some five or seven rupees a day. <laughs> and if you calculate from an inflation adjusted basis, you can imagine what the price should have been. And maybe that we keep for a separate discussion when we <laughs> extrapolate some of these numbers, the, the volume and the price of, of anything that we look for in a in a company. But we used to get a Gujarati newspaper. My grandfather used to read that, my father and me, that's Vyapar. It comes on Wednesday and Saturday. It comes even now. 
uh, once in a while i i read the online edition i think we really want to know about businesses in india it gives you a very interesting perspective and otherwise uh, i was like a frequent visitor to local libraries whether in my school my college and then there was another sankhya library where there were books on many subjects my father used to encourage me every day that uh you have to read something and also used to write my daily diary i think in early 80s uh maybe just luck had it that um we invested in some ipo in 1982 or so in lml and uh, the after few days after the listing i started seeing the price so 10 rupee ipo was like listed at 70 rupees so that generated a lot of interest in markets that money can be multi- multiplied 6 7 times in few days <laughs> in the event in the rest of the life but that generated a lot of curiosity about about stock market about businesses uh, as i said that we were in a small town very little interaction with the rest of the world so the the way to know about the world was like radio this was pre television days there so he used to listen to bbc every day uh, hindi edition used to come at 6:20 in morning i think the second show in 8 in morning and the third 8 in evening and uh, i think he used to encourage me to listen to it and it was mostly about uh, global politics global business and, and many other things uh, he would get up in fact even at very early morning we are and, and though of course uh, he didn't complete his graduation for for various reasons he could not but uh, he used to listen to the to the english version uh, early morning and used to write prizes he used to you say this sentence so we are like no i would say business to really know several of these things and but he would say like her price kuch kehta hai well i used to say that why do you write all these prices is like book would be filled with this is happening in copper this is happening in gold this is why this price has gone up dollar has weakened and we are like no business and he would say that he used to use one sentence her price kuch kehta hai every price says something and there is a story behind it and there is a story behind it i remember it is like uh, the uk <coughs> and falkland war in, in like latin america and that like for for couple of days markets were very volatile and, and variety of things and we used to hear about uh, several things about the world and i used to write this daily diary what happened i remember all the political events of of 80s like uh, uh, 84 85 when you were prime minister with a with a very different <laughs> way of looking at things and then the political and and the other economic challenges that we went through in late 80s early 90s the great bull market of first 85 i remember and of course the 92 and various other things about the about the world so uh while of course i can say this is humble background because uh we didn't have i would say like we we didn't travel much we didn't have the opportunity to interact with many people outside that town but it was rich because i think uh i i developed a sense of curiosity and uh, maybe the many things that how do i put it maybe a rustic wisdom <laughs> that kind of like people develop there by being in a place where you are constrained by by many things in the initial years we didn't have flush toilet so you can imagine the world world we lived in uh, water i mean was always in shortage in rajasthan things have improved now but you get tap water once in like few days two or three days and then if you miss those hours then you are in trouble for next two or three days so you start uh, if i think from a from a leadership or business perspective you always like allocating <laughs> uh, i mean the allocation of your time allocation of your resources you get like very frugal and you think of of world in a in a, in a different manner yeah so that way it was like very very i would say rich experience and uh, dealing with real people real world and, and, and my family my uncle and all had a lot of interest in in, in in the politics of course at the local level but never used to be like in the center if you are in those days pre express highways if you are going from jaipur to jodhpur or jaipur to udaipur i mean you like kind of pass through so a lot of people Uh, leaders used to kind of like stay there for some time and i had like great opportunity of seeing them from close quarters how they think so there are variety of of learnings and my family was very uh, involved socially uh, very very deeply in in in, in social work so i think that was another experience going to like remote areas uh, seeing the world 
uh, from from a different lens. I'm sure. I think um, I do come from a small town in Rajasthan, so I completely agree with the challenges that we used to play. And across, I think small towns across the country. Uh, so I think kids or people growing up in the 80s and 90s uh, uh, are probably more resilient uh, to deal with the complexities of today's world. Uh, so I completely agree with you. Uh, you mentioned about you yeah. use a good word actually, the resilience. I think the in in India generally, maybe for thousands of years, even when we were very prosperous. And uh, even you go back, like forget about the the Indian uh, ancient philosophy, where you know the tap or or let's say uh, uh, penance or or let's say fasting, and some of them are part of us. But even I mean, if you read like uh, a Seneca or, or or Marcus Aurelius and all of those people, I think they used to encourage that people should should live in like some tough condition just to prepare yourself better because nature one day will will, will test their resilience. So it's so interesting. When you use that word, yeah. I think I'll we'll come to resilience uh, from an Indian economic standpoint of point of view. I think you've talked a lot about resilience. How do we learn to build that in our own life, in our financial lives, and other ways? I'm I'm going to come to that. Uh, you mentioned about the support from your family and the curious curiosity that you gathered, and uh, the, thanks to your father who used to read papers, he used to talk about stocks and businesses and economics overall. But I'm sure there must be some inner compass or inner north star or something that drove you. Uh, uh, internally to come out of that life, and not really come out of their life, but to grow in life and move to a city. Apart from your education qualifications, but I think uh, uh, outside home, I'm sure you you must have had friends who were uh, still uh, willing to stay back in the village and small town in Bihar, right, and uh, uh, settle with a life uh, 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 there, right. So, what really drove you, uh, apart from your education qualification, uh, uh, to really come out and make a mark in this world? So I wouldn't take credit for that. Pure luck. So in my CA exams, I think uh, in the final exam, most of the people there because you don't have any coaching. Whatever you are reading, I mean, you are reading on your own. Uh, unlike Mumbai, where I see, I mean, all the family, friends, and the others who come to do CA, I think they spend so much of time on coaching. Uh, we didn't have that. So whatever was the study material that you got from the institute, you had to study and then give exams. I had to go to Jaipur or, or Jodhpur in those days. We didn't have the exam center there. Uh, so my father said that clear, I mean, the final exams together. So most of the people used to give like uh, the first and the, and the second part separately. He said, no, no, I mean, we don't have that much of time. So why don't you kind of like just give it together? Because I gave it together and luck had it that I got rank and this was 50th rank. Uh, all India, but it also shows the role of luck in life. That had I got one mark less, maybe life would have taken a very, very different turn. And that one mark more, which got me into the merit list, brought me here because in those days, I mean, if you are in merit list of CA, you get so many interview letters. I like full file of them, and uh, I appeared for many of them. Uh, and luck had it, I got selected at many places. I chose Aditya Birla Group. They were. Uh, setting up financial services, had big plans to to be in all spheres of financial services, particularly the mutual fund, which kind of like attracted me. Uh, and uh, of course, though, though I, I remained in the holding company for, for a couple of years, worked in various spheres, but that I think really, really made all the difference. Uh, there's this book of Malcolm Gladwell that, you know, uh, outliers, where he said that the, the thing which is common between Steve Jobs, uh, Paul Allen, uh, Bill Gates, Steve Ballmer, uh, Vinod, Vinod Khosla, all of them is, I think they were all born in 1954 or 55, one single year. Same as the story with people who built railroads, so on and so forth, because they were at the right time at the right place in their college. And then when, when the whole shift happened in computing, so similar, similar for us in India, I think in early nineties, if we got into financial services, we were so lucky. Thing just opened up 91, 92. We had that great bull market, and then institutions got set up uh, right from NSC to a variety of things with CB with and all that. And the growth of this industry, I think if you worked uh, with with deep sense of integrity, with purpose, worked hard, and, and everything else got taken care of. I can also relate to Warren Buffett's like winning the ovarian lottery. So, one that I was born there, where I think I got exposure which i wouldn't have got had i like born in a large city with a with a different comforts of life 
but i think i i lived in constraints and i lived with absolutely outstanding people in terms of my teachers my family and the stories that i heard about my grandfather great grandfather what they did for society and i think the the ca which got me into into the bella group and then you know the the next several years were so so interesting so i don't think that i had a plan for life like that i strongly believe in flow uh i never thought about like uh, you know the my next move my next job my next whatever never uh it's just that life takes you where where it takes you and just just keep working hard <laughs> i think yeah that's right just keep showing up every day i think that is that, that's Absolutely, such an important yeah. just, you know, that's a great right sentence uh, yeah you you always articulate so so well and just, just just keep showing up every day <laughs> i'm sure i think so it's so gratifying to uh, hear you talk about the role of luck uh, I mean, though I'm also sure that even if you scored a, a 51st or a 60th rank, you would not be very far from where you are today. And um, by the dint of no, your hard work and everything, right? So you, you being too humble. Uh, uh, most important lessons uh, that you've learned growing up. So you talked about curiosity or always being curious and always being a student. But apart from that, most important lessons that you've learned uh, uh, while growing up and in your career, in the initial part of your career. That's question number one. and second question i'm not sure someone asked you ever uh, you you spent the first 25 years of your life uh, 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 in hindi medium right uh, and you speak flawless english so uh, did you work hard towards that or it just happened as you came to bombay and you just worked your way through corporations where english was a predominant language so i don't know whether i speak flawless english uh, my hindi was pretty good i mean i always would have like uh, stood first second and in the essay competitions Uh, in Hindi, I used to read a lot of Hindi literature, and of course, because of my family and 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 all the you know the surrounding, had read like a lot of scriptures. I was so lucky uh, uh, to be part of that. But yeah, English, I think it's just that you are, you are in Mumbai and in this world, so over a period of time, I I I wrote my CA exams in English and my my postgraduate my M Com. Uh, exam in English, though I I had the choice of writing in Hindi, but because I wanted to test that, uh, I did that. Uh, but otherwise, I think we used to get this uh, English paper. You know, I, I tell you interesting about uh, that English so that the Economic Times was very costly in those days. I think in eighties also it was five bucks or something. Early ninety was seven rupees. on an inflation adjusted you can calculate what the price would have been today they started a wednesday edition uh, with brand equity uh, at 2 rupees and it used to be like the glossy paper at 2 rupees of brand equity four four pages and uh, they had corporate dossier in on, on friday so you read about ck prahlad strategy some articles from howard and water on friday uh and that was priced at 2 rupees lesser than than the normal price it was like a marketing strategy to to so that you order for all 7 days we started with only those 2 days and uh, in, in in childhood i mean they were like very very interesting and that also gave me deep interest in the world of advertising and marketing and in those days like you read about the alik padam si and you know all the variety of those very interesting campaigns in in 80s and early 90s and and and, and the world just began Now from from like India businesses perspective, and the reading about the strategy and all that, uh, and 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 the corporate uh, culture in and on the Friday. So that was maybe my introduction, a little bit maybe here and there. But yeah, it's it's like kind of over the years reading and writing and speaking that that would have made the articulation better. But still, uh, I'm definitely not what <laughs> I would have been had I had I grown in a in a different place. What was the first question on language? What was on the lesson. second one? That's uh, the second question. The first was on the most important lessons uh, that you've learned growing up that you that have really helped you in life. Many actually, as I said, that uh, one I think living in 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 constraints. Uh, so I mean, the, the the electricity won't be there in in peak winter and in peak summer because I mean the the uh, peak load. <laughs> uh the, the electricity will, will will go off during afternoon and in in peak summer and and in rajasthan you know the the temperature goes from like one extreme to another uh so i think i like that as i said the tap water was like a luxury uh, i mean many things was like a, like a luxury there so you you learned so much from that you learned so much i think the resilience and 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 later on i got deeply interested in in what do i didn't have that word but 
what Nassim Taleb calls about the anti-fragile that uh, in any of these adversity, uh, you, you, you just don't become resilient. You just kind of like uh, take that challenge, but also how to become better from that. Uh, every challenge that makes you better. And I think COVID is a classic case. I think India has come out as a better country than what we were pre-COVID. We not only handled COVID well, but actually we came out better as a society, uh, as, a, as a country, as an economy. Uh, so that's like you become, uh, how do you how do you learn that not only coping up with that situation or, or the circumstances, but that you learn something so that you actually come out better from that. And many of the lessons, as I said, that family had deep influence on me. We are like a lot of small businesses. We were like mostly kind of like inventing agent. Uh, one other thing I can tell you, so yeah, many things like, you know, in textiles, uh, there were a lot of those local chemical units. I mean, the textile units we used to buy chemicals and we were the indenting agent. And the textile merchants of Mumbai, Surat, Ahmedabad, various places, the Chilkaranji and all will come and, and they will sell their stuff to the uh, local wholesalers or semi-wholesalers. And we were the indenting agent kind of like uh, matching both of them. Uh, cotton prices used to go up and down. And there would be times when you have done the pre-booking for, let's say, next three months of, of goods and then prices have gone up. So then maybe the economics has changed. And my grandfather used to say that there are two kinds of vendors. There are two kinds of these uh, mills. Uh, the one guy would say that I will probably reduce one or two thread in the final fabric. It won't be seen. You won't really come to know that I've changed the quality so that I can break even or still make some money. And there would be another uh, textile mill or, or there would be another <coughs> owner who would maintain that quality because that's what, what kind of like differentiate them over a period of time. Highly unlikely that a local wholesaler, I mean, they don't use the eyeglass for the final fabric. It doesn't really make that much of difference. But from our conversation, because these people in small town, they would stay with us. They will always have food with us. I mean, it's more like a pure. So in, in a small places, uh, and, and India is all about that, like 90% of the people uh, run businesses like that. Uh, the family, your business, and uh, the relationship get like quite mixed up, uh, 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 quite kind of like uh, intertwined. So they will have a lot of conversation about their family, their worldview and all. And he used to say that this family or, or this viewpoint that I just reduce one or two thread, it's okay. When we have the conversation, prices went up so much uh, and then you would have lost money and one guy would say, no, no, I didn't lose because I, I just changed the quality a little bit. And he used to say that his next generation won't have this smell. It was so interesting and it has like wasted in my mind after like maybe the 40, I'm talking about like when I was 10, 11, 9 and now 40 years that this next generation won't have the smell. And the person who's saying that I will lose money in this quarter, it wasn't good for me, but I booked something and I deliver the same quality used to say that the second and third generation will thrive a lot more because this is what is important to them. The another thing also like thinking about all stakeholders, maybe in a different way. So, I mean, the guy thinks about customers or thinks about the quality and the message that he sends to his people that the prices have gone up, so just reduce the thread. So he said his employees know about it, his vendors know about it. Then he thinks that he's smart, but he's not because maybe they would shortchange him in some other manner, right? I mean, those people will, will shortchange uh, him or her in a, in, a, in a different manner. And he also used to say like every time, like, sabka dhyan rakho. It's like you have to and in, in a different manner, ki pata nahi kiski se paisa aata hai. we don't know whose blessings kind of uh, keep our, 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 our kitchen on. So take care of everybody uh, surrounding us, like whether it's a driver or whether it's, a, it's, it's anyone, any help. But it was also, I think, about the whole ESG thing, right? I mean, the stakeholder <laughs> management that it's not only about uh, your shareholders, it's not only about... I mean, and one stakeholder, but ensure that all stakeholders, then only I think you can you can keep creating lasting and, and sustainable value. I, I, I think those years were like really phenomenal for me from from learning perspective. The other thing, you know, interesting uh, is like happiness that uh, I feel that I was so happy, right? I mean, we didn't have all those luxuries. I said that you lose <laughs> electricity when you need it the most. And when it comes back, let's say you lost the uh, electricity and fan is off at 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. suddenly comes and you feel so happy. Wow. 
uh, so I, I, again, I mean, uh, happiness is like completely inside, and you cannot look far or outside. <laughs> That's so true. You you took me back to my own memories of childhood, right? Uh, I remember. Uh, Where are you that, from? I I come from Alwar in Rajasthan. So. Yeah. Oh, I know, I know. Bajaj, 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 Bajaj. Yeah. By the way, I must say this about and, and actually throughout 80s, I was deeply involved in market. Not that we had money to invest and we were not doing much, but it's just a curiosity. So much of curiosity. 1985 bull market was like really I so entrenched in my mind. And you know, in those days, the IPOs in 80s and early 90s, people wouldn't know this. Alwar is like not many people who are listening to this show would know that Bajaza Bazaar Alwar used to put more applications than some of the largest cities in India. Oh. <laughs> That's the main market. <laughs> there was in, in those days, the stock market was so interesting that people used to do multiple applications in, in IPOs. And this was like pre-KYC and pre-PAN, Aadhaar and all of those days, right? So one person used to do like 10, 20 applications with different names and, and, and the same address. <laughs> And there is to be like people will put their, there were firms, uh, stockbrokers who would put like hundreds of applications from one office to get the allotment. Well, that's a great insight to have on my city. So thank you for sharing <laughs> that. Uh, you you said you came to uh, Bombay after your CA because you got a job uh, and you chose Aditya Bitla Group. So uh, uh, that was, I think, your entry into the markets and the financial markets, right? But over a period of time, what kept you interested? Uh, in being in the financial markets and how has your journey um, in this industry uh, influenced your uh, personal philosophy on wealth and success? Yeah, I, I, I think it's so interesting. As I said, that uh, curiosity every day is a new day in market. Every day you are learning. And in India, we just opened up early 90s. I mean, uh, the private sector mutual funds came in. In a few years time, we saw the private sector insurance companies. Those were the days, primary dealers in bond market, secondary deal. In fact, there was another concept of satellite dealer, which I applied to, to RBI and, and, and Birla Global. And then we got that membership. The bond markets were very interesting, by the way, in those days. And uh, before NSE came in, in, in 94, uh, the first experiment with online trading uh, was OTC Exchange of India, over the counter uh, Exchange of India, which is like a pure online trading. It was so fascinating. I was a market maker in, in, in Birla Global those days. It used to be called Birla Growth Fund Limited. Then we became Birla Global Finance. And, um, you know, very, very uh, interesting concept of like smaller companies. Maybe I can relate between the NSE's online trading and maybe some kind of a depository system pre uh, depository and some kind of like SME exchange all uh, intertwined into one and I was we were like one of the major player there and and, and um, but the BSE was like open outcry also a lot of arbitrage opportunities so we used to do arbitrage between there between like a lot of stock exchanges because in those days Calcutta, Chennai, Bangalore, Ahmedabad, Delhi all of these stock exchanges open outcry system uh, so you buy from there at a lower price, you sell uh, live in, in, in Mumbai, uh, in Bombay Stock Exchange, some of those kind of arbitrages, both in equity as well as in bonds. In fact, it's very interesting. Uh, I was a market maker, along with some of my colleagues, a market maker in several of the NCDs. We used to call it Khokha market, like Reliance J Series, H Series, Arvin Mills, Hindalco, uh, Grassim, uh, it was I think Valiant Shooting or, or, or Grassim, Indian Rayon, Tisco, Telco, which is Tata Steel, uh, Telco, uh, Tata Motors. Their bonds used to get regularly trade, uh, traded in the retail market. So you buy, accumulate from various brokers. Once you have built a lot, you go and sell it to one of the large institutions like LIC or or UTI or GIC in those days. So today we talk about the retailization of the market. It was actually other way around. The retail interest was quite big. You buy from then and once you have accumulated, then you sell to a, to a large institution. All of those things, I think, kind of uh, kept me very, very interested. 97, 98 was that Asian uh, financial crisis, uh, Russian crisis, LTCM. Uh, and, and a lot of challenges and suddenly the rupee and then markets became extremely volatile rupee went up from like 31 to 37 38 so the group set up a forex advisory cell and two of us were part of that i used to write a daily on on global foreign exchange and, and money market and send it to like all the all the large guys in the group and some of the other corporate clients so for one one and a half years there 
for a year i was on our cell side farm uh, the jv partner chain and i had like very interesting experience we we were very large player in the whole vyajvadla system which was a pre futures and then uh, got deeply involved when derivatives came to india so uh, i think our, our, our ceo was part of the mf committee which kind of like was working with sebi so I was deeply involved in derivatives so i read so much about about how the derivatives markets have got developed globally and what funds can do what other participants can do so both in our sell side as well as in buy side firm what could be our role so it was like so much was happening swaps market i think in our firm we did the first swap transaction interest rate swap transaction i can go on uh so every year was like so much was happening in india and in during the entire period the regulation the way it changed and how india like in a short period of time became so transparent and and such an amazing technological infrastructure we have always been at the cutting edge as a, as a country we don't give ourselves as much credit even on the corporate governance side uh, throughout 90s i think under uh, mr dr mehta and sebi and then some of his uh, successors what mr bhavi did with, with the whole dematerialization and everybody what they did to transform indian markets to where it is today it was like a fascinating journey and i was so lucky that at early age in my 20s and my 30s probably involved in every possible thing in the uh, in the financial markets so so lucky so lucky to be at the at the right time at right place and being part of this fascinating journey over over 30 years so the 10 years before that uh, in that small town was more like seeing as an outsider and observing it and writing a daily diary or what's happening in the market those things in ipos and variety of things and then later on being a very active participant and not only as a mere spectator or or just like an investor investing and buying and selling but being part of the evolution of of this market and and kept reading about like what was happening in in the rest of the world also did cfa and all of that a little later which kind of like gave another opportunity to keep reading and and remaining involved in like what was happening outside india as well i think that's a it's a long wide journey uh, how has this journey uh, in the industry influenced your personal philosophy on wealth wealth creation you know for whatever reasons because <clears throat> it's always in this uh, profession where uh, once i came into the industry it, it always became like um, making money for others right i mean it may sound a little how do i say and i i i hope i don't get it wrong but uh, it's never been as i said that life is all about luck and 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 your part and you are just in the flow you get up in morning and 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 take like another day and and put your best and you believe that your yeah, wealth will get uh, created but passionate about like making money for for the other people and and this is what this this industry gives you an an opportunity to uh, all of these things that today we talk about the power of compounding the discipline and all of that of course as an individual investor i didn't get it for a for a long time in in the early years but over a period of time being part of this industry you you learn like uh, all of that uh, over a period of time yeah So I don't know whether the question was on wealth creation. For no, I think uh, just your personal philosophy on wealth. How did you pursue or how do you look at wealth creation uh, when you were starting out and being in the markets uh, for over thirty years now? How has that philosophy changed? Right. What does we, what does wealth creation really mean to you on a personal basis? So, so off late, up can yeah, we 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 invest uh, all the money in our own funds and that grows. I think India has done so well for all of us. Again, like going back to the ovarian lottery of of Buffett, uh, keeping faith in the India story and just remaining invested that has done well. Uh, the uh, you know again like going back to those that my grandfather used to say, "Sai itna dijiye jame kutum samai, sai itna dijiye jame kutum samai. Na me bhuka na hu na sadhu bhuka jaye." i mean the you don't kind of like run after money you don't have like those goals and then then kind of like work towards it but i think if you are in the right business and and if you are in this things will get taken care of also something very interesting and in one of my like uh, senior several years back said something very interesting that in the long run the amount of wealth that you have won't depend on how much money you make in the very long arc of things how much wealth you have won't depend on how much money you make every month but how much money your money makes 
so it's a very important part how you how you invest uh, and and how particular you are about that of course i should have learned that you know in, in a more more better manner but this is what i think uh, over the last several years i think india has been moving in the in the right direction and it's so good to see the whole sip movement that we have been able to to create and over a period of time this all about like like the discipline uh and 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 uh, you know the whole power of compounding which is like so i would say uh, under appreciated fact of life is is we are able to kind of like create that yeah you uh, wrote a note some time back which was titled on the top of the world uh, yet a long way to go and in that note you wrote that it is often yeah. said that china is growing old before growing rich while india on its part has always been culturally and spiritually rich and it is high time that in this amrit kal every citizen also becomes economically rich before growing old and we regain our old title of sone ki chidiya or the bird of gold so i would like you to explain more on this about your vision for india and how uh, we uh, uh, as investors or otherwise can benefit from what you visualize that lies waiting for our country you are right i think so we are where well, let's say us would have been in 1940s uh, in terms of per capita gdp uk would have been 1950s uh, japan would have been in 60s korea taiwan in maybe early 80s and in china in like early 2000 2001 2 and and we have seen how how per capita gdp has grown over the years in these countries india will go through a similar journey but i think the the point i always made is that india's journey is going to be very different than most of these countries because uh, i think our growth will be lot more democratic lot more sustainable lot more equitable and lot more inclusive and and our growth model is very different a classic example of let's say china where a lot more state driven and wasn't as i would say sustainable they never cared about the planet they never cared about people i think india at such early stage at 2000 dollars per capita the social security net that we are building the ease of living and the sheer focus of the government in last 10 years i mean whether it's a toilet to a uh, you know an lpg cylinder to a basic electricity to an led bulb to a uh, aishman bharat to you know a basic bank account to a basic rupee card to variety of things uh, tap water and all of that and and let's say the food to millions of people it's it's, it's so i would say a uh, compassionate and a very very different model and also the the focus on planet and and making it sustainable uh, both by the policy makers and the government makes me a lot more positive on the sustainability of our growth i think the stars are aligned for india in terms of demographics i mean i used to use those four d demography uh, demographics uh, democracy demand and digitalization recently in last couple of years i have added the fifth d which is a determination i've never seen indians as determined to do well uh, across society and i travel to the like several small parts of the country and i i i see a big difference in in society you see the new age entrepreneurs coming from smaller towns you see the new age artists coming from smaller parts of the town you see these uh, creators on on social media coming from different parts of town and the hunger that they have that makes me very very positive on india that article on top of the world but we had a long way to go was about when we became the most populous country in the world but my point was that we are still at 2500 dollars per capita and over a period of time in next 20 25 years as we move towards a developed country we may have a developed world digital infrastructure we already have that uh, we would have a developed world physical infrastructure of course we have a long way to go but we are moving in that direction and most likely the way we moved on the digital side where we leave from from a most data poor society in the world to the most data rich society in the world in a 10 years time there's a possibility that we leave frog in social infrastructure also in education healthcare you know there are like uh, almost 500 million people on abha we all know about what has happened in digitalization of finance in india and how we just move from like very few bank branches to like everybody has bank branch in the pocket today i mean in, in terms of of upi and many other things similar thing will happen in healthcare similar thing will happen in education so we'll leave from there but what india needs to do a lot more on one of the thing that shouldn't get neglected in all of this when we are doing all the other structural reforms the way we are putting our <coughs> 
fiscal and monetary policy uh, framework like a developed country, the way we are putting our, our infrastructure and all of that is the retirement security. So we have the youngest or the best demographics uh, in, in, in the world in, compared to any large economy. We take pride that our median age is 28 or 29 for next 20, 25 years will remain one of the youngest country, will be the largest uh, you know, the labor supplier to the world, uh, skilled or semi-skilled, will be the largest supplier of consumers to the world. But over a period of time, we'll also have large number of people who would be there in 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. And, and given the public debt to GDP, the starting point that we have, government even after 25 years won't have enough money to give for their retirement. We won't be able to take care of like all the citizens from that perspective, which means that what policymakers and along with everybody in the financial system has to do is to ensure that people invest a lot more in risk assets and, and, and build that nest over a period of time. And we have a short window of next 20, 25 years. And our fiscal policy, our taxation policy, our regulation, the behavior of all the participants in financial markets or, or in the uh, corporate world has to ensure that everything that we do is geared towards that. It's not only about you know, having the constant uh, supply of capital to build this country or to build businesses or to create economic growth, but to ensure that every single household is participating in that by investing in that growth, that is very, very critical. So that article was about that. How do you, uh, so uh, given the fact that, okay, India has long, long years to grow and we, uh, there are a lot of things which are working in our favor. I think you've also somewhere mentioned about that the only or the biggest risk that India faces is that of a self goal, right? So, uh, what are those self goals that you can think or we can visualize or the risks to this growth story that uh, uh, investors or people should be aware of? Uh, you know, if you look, look at the growth models of the economy, I talked about like several countries which have grown from, let's say, a frontier to an emerging to a developed country. Uh, there have been like many, many models of that over the last 150 years. We have seen uh, the capitalism, the best and the worst of it. We have seen socialism, the best and the worst of it. I get reminded of that. I think uh, Churchill's quote that the sin of capitalism is that it distributes wealth unequally. And the sin of socialism or communism is that it, it, it distributes misery <laughs> uh, equally. So both are, are not the right model. We have to evolve our own model, which is like capitalism with conscience. We have to support the wealth creators, uh, but at the same time have to be very, very compassionate that in a democratic setup and we are the most a thriving democracy in the world. It's just incredibly beautiful democracy that any society can take pride in uh, from where we started in 1947. I've come a long way. In 1947, nobody thought that we would remain uh, like this, a one united uh, uh, thriving democracy because odds were against us in many ways, given the multi-ethnic and, and variety of other challenges that we had on, on economic front, not blessed with right <laughs> kind of neighbors so and so forth. But we have remained like we have really thrived. I think what we need to do is that over the next 20, 25 years, when the world is so fragile uh, in terms of geopolitics, in terms of technological disruptions, in terms of uh, you know the changes in the society and many other disruptions, we have to ensure that, uh, and it is not like the best of globalization last 20, 30 years and some of the countries who did, who, who worked hard and they grew so much. Uh, there'll be many forces where where it won't be like, like really easy for us to grow much faster because the rest of the world isn't growing at, at that pace. And in that, we have to ensure that if you have to grow at a substantially higher rate in a democratic and a sustainable manner, just going back to the point on like climate change as well, we have to ensure that we don't make any mistake which can derail that, that growth. And that's a collective responsibility of everyone, whether you are policymakers, whether you are regulators, whether you are, you are in business, whether you are in any part of the society that as a country, we don't do self goal. And if you go back in human history, thousands of years, like when it looked like that this society is poised for a great time or this economy is poised for a great time, several examples in like Latin America or some of the other parts of Asia, etc., they couldn't make it. And this is what we need to keep in mind that while there is an opportunity, but it's not like 
written like it is not carved in stone that we will we will make it and we should not get complacent at any point in time which can derail this this massive opportunity that is in front of us and we have to work hard of course the uh, mr murthy got like kind of quite a flag when he mentioned about that 70 hours or whatever this is my view i don't think he meant by number of hours or something it's an attitude that we have to work hard we are at $2,500 per capita. I mean, we are like the largest uh, population in the world. A large part of the society is yet to kind of get the full, you know, the fruits of that growth. And and, and there are a lot of things which are stacked up maybe against us uh, from a global perspective, like climate change is one. And then some of the geopolitical risks are the other or, or the wave of deglobalization is, is against. In that, I think we have, all of us have to continuously work harder and harder, like, Perseverance cannot be uh, kind of like, there's no no alternate to it. But I think a good growth story, a good background can only take you so far, right? Beyond that, it's a matter of uh, working harder as citizens. I think that is what builds countries and nations over years and years. And I think that is one lesson that we can definitely take from other countries that where people have really worked hard over decades and years to build something that uh, we see as a developed world. So I think, uh, yeah, that's a great lesson. Uh, so I want to talk to you about Namneet about uh, the annual letter that you write, which is uh, your person of the year annual letter, which is widely read and valued by all kinds of investors across uh, every year among the most important events that happen worldwide. You pick out one idea and not person as a person of the year. Tell me about the uh, genesis of this wonderful idea of writing this annual note. And even if we are just into the third month of 2024 who are your top contenders for the person of the year <laughs> for 2024 so far if you wish to offer some hint i've always had the habit of of writing uh, as i told you that i mean essay competition was something that i that i always liked and uh, luck had it that uh, even my professional life from very early days uh, I think I, I have continuously been writing a monthly uh, going back when, when I was a market maker on OTC exchange. We are used to have this newsletter, monthly newsletter, OTC something, OTC. And then it was a market roundup, a daily market roundup I wrote for several years. There used to be this roundup on foreign exchange and money market in those like 90s, uh, so on and so forth. And then I think sometime in either in 2003 or four. And uh, those are the three years where the bond market did exceptionally well. Uh, the 10-year government bond yield in 1999 was 11% and it fell to 5% in 2003 4 So, and I was a bond fund manager. So, there were three consecutive years where my guild fund delivered close to like 20% CAGR or so. And that was a period where equity market didn't do well, right? I mean, the Sensex peaked at around 6,000 in February of 2000 and bottomed at like 2,800, 2,900 in March of 2003 or so. And then you have a bond market, which is like delivering double digit returns for three, four years. And I just wrote, so I used to write this monthly uh, or even like several dailies uh, market roundup writing on variety of things and then that year i thought this is like something exceptional and i should write an annual letter so i wrote like many things that happened and then towards the end i said that 10.18 gui 2026 is my man of the year by the way it used to be called man of the year and i in 2010 uh, rising power of women was my man of the year so from that onwards it became person of the year um, so the, the 10.18 2000 GUI, the government bond 2026 is my man of the year. And I wrote so much about like how people have created wealth by owning a government bond and, and so on and so forth. And then it's it, it so happened that from next year onwards, every year I thought that it became like an annual ritual, just kind of like going back uh, into the year and seeing like various events and trying to pick few things i don't think it's about like that particular person of the year because there are many things which i i write in uh, in that uh, and it's just that you have to put something as like person of the year but maybe there would have been years where maybe some of the other things were maybe a lot more relevant and important than than that but yeah this is something that i really felt that it's a it's a, it's a big force or it's a it's a big trend or a paradigm shift that we are seeing which is probably not getting noticed in all the noise that uh, we have during that time or, 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 or in that year. 
so uh, since you write this every year i was reading your 2023 person of the year note uh, where you wrote uh, that millions are betting their futures on options so futures what's the derivative <laughs> uh, yeah. and you also mentioned that uh, remember that wealth is patiently fermented with focus on fundamentals and not instantly brewed bites and bites and butters yeah. <laughs> so i think this is a great advice yeah. for young investors most of who had have already only seen a raging bull market over the last 3 to 4 years so please explain more on that no absolutely in fact uh, in some other context i also wrote about like the gamification of market and gamification of market uh, there's so much of machines that have come uh, nothing wrong with that so much of mathematics has come so much of you know the, the whole short termism has come uh, nothing wrong with that which should not be at the cost of common sense and wisdom uh, and uh, i mean i'm sure everybody knows about what's happening in the fndo market in india and it's not only the fndo market but what people are doing in some of the other gaming apps and and uh, what people are doing on 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 some of the other things like of course crypto it's done so well people have certain views i'm not an expert uh, but but find it difficult when <laughs> the people who invest in like real businesses and 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 grow wealth so they it's it's important that uh, uh for for wealth creation in the long run i've, I've kind of like created this acronym that or or maybe a formula that the wealth creation there, there's only one formula of wealth creation in the long run which is stp which is sound investment plus time plus patience and if you take out any of these three you won't be able to create wealth in the uh, in the long run you need to do sound investment and then you need to have give it time and you need to have patience uh, when we know that these days in fndo the average holding period is 30 minutes and uh, people are looking at like weekly options and all of that uh, but the good part is that what it tells me when when in our industry we, we think about all of this uh there are 200 million people on on gaming apps betting maybe every day on cricket and variety of things or people are playing you know the, the other gaming apps etc or those crypto apps what it tells me that in society people want to be rich people want to make money uh people want to create wealth they haven't found the right way yet but it just tells me that there is a change in society a big shift in the society is people are willing to take risk and then they are not as risk averse as we have always been thinking in fact i used to mention that that risk appetite if you go back in 80s and early 90s uh, the amount of money mutual funds were collecting in 1992 bull market and if you look at the wave of ipos in in 90s then we haven't really reached there so indians by nature are 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 risk seeking and not as risk averse as we have thought looking at the number of people who are in capital markets or in mutual fund industry but maybe i think we are seeing a revival of that and the technology has made it easier and easier now you have like that's what i wrote about not by bites and buttons uh, but but i think you need to be have that patience and sometimes uh, maybe the deep work of of cal newport has to be read or some of the other stuff uh, or or maybe the the whole uh, instant gratification versus delayed gratification some of those things i think people need to kind of like think a lot about when it comes to wealth creation but but that's where i think the role of our industry people like you people like me people everybody in this industry how do we ensure that um uh, at a time when country is going to do well uh, economy is going to do well over the next several decades at a time when we'll have this tremendous once in a generation once in a life uh, comes in in, in 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 you know in the history of a country of this extraordinary wealth creation how do we do that in the in the right manner uh yeah but but we we will move in that direction yeah and i'm so sure sure uh, about that and i also meet a lot of young investors that i think as you rightly mentioned that risk taking is all there but all they need i think is is some kind of guidance uh, towards the ideas of long term compounding the ideas of dealing some gratification and not enjoying the entire gratification at this point of time right so uh, also if i can add it, it's about the experimentation uh, the good part of this and i've always believed i mean when people say youngsters are like that i mean every generation has been smarter than the previous generation and there is no difference between like let's say uh, and it's not different for this generation also they are far smarter than us 
I, th- I think they are experimenting. They are open for many ideas. Uh, maybe in our generation, one wanted safety of, of a job where you can retire, right? Now they are open for many things. A lot of people after their whatever, you know, in a college or a university are looking to start on their own. So they are, and then, and of course, the people who have chosen, chosen many paths, then, then the limited number of, let's say, the avenues which were available to us, or we wanted to choose from a, from a narrow set of, of, let's say, uh, options. Today, they are, they are like very, very open and want to explore, be it in their education, be it the way they interact, be it the way, uh, you know, they, they, they deal in many things. And this is also a part of that wider, I would say, uh you know the the experimentation but i think it yeah it's like a, a collective responsibility of all of us that they get us in the right direction and they will they will because for on one side we say that youngsters are doing this they are they're playing in fndo but at the same time when we see our number there are larger and larger number of of uh, millennials or Gen Z, whatever you call them, uh, the youngsters who are also doing SIPs. So I, I, I feel very, very positive about it. That's right. I remember giving a, so I teach at Flame University uh, uh, and I remember giving a, a small talk on um, financial freedom, the idea of financial freedom uh, uh, to undergrads. Uh, there were like 500, 600 students in the auditorium and wow. uh, received a, a few uh, emails and messages after that uh, seeking my <laughs> thoughts on starting a, a, a small side business so that they can start earning money and start putting in SIPs so that they can work start walking towards the journey of financial freedom. So the yeah. 18, 20 year old that you're talking about, I see uh, are, are much, much smarter than I think I was at even 35 yeah. or 40. Okay. So yeah. I think so. It, it, it's only a matter of combining that risk taking with uh, uh, the right kind of literacy in yeah. finances and uh, all those kind of things. So yeah, uh, great responsibility. Uh, you 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 are a very keen observer uh, uh, on uh, the the Indian economy and and investing in India particularly. Uh, so looking towards the future, how do you anticipate the world of investing uh, will evolve? particularly in India and what are the key trends or changes you foresee and how do you think investors can prepare for these shifts? You know, the interesting part is when we compare our growth story with many other growth stories and and I talked about some of the other developed countries. So US comes like very close to, let's say, what we are going to see in capital markets uh, relatively. Uh, you compare our story with, let's say, China. So our per capita today or, or the size of the economy is very similar to where China was in 2002, three. And look at this Shanghai uh, index. It has just doubled or so, right? I mean, the economy has grown from two, three trillion dollar to eighteen trillion dollars. Per capita has gone up from twenty five hundred to twelve thousand dollars. They have created some, you know, huge uh, giant businesses, but the market could not convert that growth into into the returns for the minority shareholders or a mutual fund investor. Now, India is very interesting, where for a long time. You have an economy which has consistently been growing at a, at a very decent pace. You have a corporate sector which is converting that profit into, which is converting that growth into the corporate profits and a capital market which is kind of uh, converting that profit into the uh, uh, market cap returns or, or, or the returns, market returns, which are available for even a minority shareholder and a mutual fund industry so well regulated and developed which is offering that opportunity to even an investor who's doing a 500 rupee per month sip so an economy which has been growing at let's say last 30 years at 10 11 percent nominal gdp growth corporate profit growth which is slightly higher than that a market cap growth which is slightly higher than that and then a mutual fund industry which could generate an alpha over and above that and could deliver to an investor. This hasn't happened in many societies in the world. Uh, there are very, very few examples like that. And that makes me very positive about India. That when I say the growth could be a lot more equitable and inclusive, apart from the efforts that the government is doing on social security, we also have a capital market which can ensure that this growth gets delivered to a much larger uh, set of investors. And I think 
on a separate note when you asked me like how the markets will look like how the how the growth of let's say next 30 40 years there are striking parallels between what we are seeing in india now and what happened in us in 1980s so in U us if you have seen like what happened in 60s 70s and in 1980 uh, you had like the bout of inflation, uh, inflation does like 15, 16% and it's unthinkable. Of course, we saw inflation at 10% this year in India, but in 1980, uh, when Paul Walker was the chairman of, of US Federal Reserve was, you know, has to, had to deal with a double digit inflation, global commodity prices shot up, the Shah of Iran left the country, many, many things without, without getting much into it. And the Paul Walker said, I will break the back of inflationary expectations in US. Of course, it was tough for the economy. It was like a war against uh, uh, inflation. But what it did was that for next several decades, people got comfort that US won't have that bout of inflation. Again, the Federal Reserve will ensure that we don't have that kind of, of uh, inflation. Inflationary expectations got very well anchored after that. And of course, it got helped by many other things, which is primarily the globalization uh, and the productivity gains, which kept inflation low. So that's the first, and you see India in 2014, we adopted a monetary policy framework that we will anchor inflation around 4%. So that's the first parallel. The second parallel, is uh, Ronald Reagan said that in 1980, government has no business to be in business. And he really believed in like, uh, you, know, you know, changing the, the course of the, uh, the economy and country in, in a manner which wasn't liked by some, liked by some. And I don't think that the current regime is driven by that, not at all. Uh, but I think there are striking parallel when we, when we heard from the prime minister, less government, more governance. And the way, I mean, selling Air India, I mean, it would have been unthinkable till a few years back. And the many other structural reforms that we had in a short period of time would have been like absolutely unthinkable. So much of focus on, on ease of doing business, ease of living. So that's another like striking parallel. The third parallel is the demographics, the baby boomers. And then you can see the best of demographics in India. In fact, it's interesting that uh, over the next 25 years, the one of the highest growth in our in our demographic chart would be in the people in the in the 40s or so and that's when people people think about investing the most and the importance of of capital markets the fourth parallel was the 401k moment of of us and when we look at sip in india or epfo choosing to to allocate some money to equity and some of the other instruments. And it looks like very, very similar. Now, these four put together gave US a period, what I call nice, non-inflationary continued expansion, non-inflationary continued expansion. And India can expect something similar for next 30, 40 years. What it also did for the US was because people had so much of faith in the economy and country, they started taking a lot more risk and they were investing in mutual funds, whether it's or passive, uh, the alternative market got developed. I mean, you had all the Blackstones and the KKR and the Apollo and Oct Oak Tree and Warburg Pinkers and all of that. So the private equity, venture capital, uh, the muni bonds, uh, REITs, infrastructure charts, uh, high yielding bonds, everything got, got developed so much. And in, in the next like 30 or 40 years, I think India is going to have a very similar journey. So in 1980, a fidelity or a capital would have been like, let's say less than $100 billion, $50, $60 billion, which is where we are. And you can imagine where we would be in the next 25, 30 years when India becomes 20, 25 trillion dollar economy. Uh, the alternative industry, uh, the passive guy, BlackRock wasn't even born in 1980. They came a little later as an offshoot from, from Blackstone and, and where it is managing trillions of dollars. We are going to see something very, very similar because I think our capital markets are like, whether from a governance perspective, technology perspective, the market ecosystem, the talent which is available, and the history and, and, and the civilization where we always believed in, in, in wealth creation. We always believed in, in that's one of the longest history of, of capital markets, uh, would be here. You know, it's interesting, just digressing for a minute. Uh, I did a lot of work in late nineties when derivatives came to, came to India, they got introduced and then we were allowed to participate in mutual fund also. And maybe one of the early fund manager who would have done something, uh, in, in, in that. And, you know, interesting part was that I could relate to my childhood where my grandfather would explain that how the 
options trading used to be in like 1920s and 30s right and and of course he didn't know the the black shoals he didn't know the <laughs> theta and the rho and and whatever the volatility of volatility the gamma and all of that but the, the lingo was very similar and he said it's like generations for for which like let's say a cotton or or a silver or a gold would have got traded in india so i think we have a history and there's a possibility that we present ourselves as like the capital the capital market today like everything has come from mostly uh, from let's say us maybe 20 30 years later for the next set of economies we become the role model for how to have run an economy in such a democratic and sustainable manner and how to have a capital market which promotes uh, 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 wealth creation and capital formation and an industry uh, which kind of like ensures that those those fruits are are distributed to a larger set of people but i, well, feel I think very those are fascinating that. insights uh, navneet yeah. uh, uh, my concern maybe uh, being in the mutual fund industry and looking and, and being there uh, at the center of it all i think you can solve that uh, in terms of the uh, supply of quality paper quality businesses right unlike us indian companies uh, there are only very few indian companies that have reached certain level and uh, mostly we have a lot of mid size businesses small size businesses and if you look at the valuations right they already like 80 90 times if i were to just use a price to earnings number right are you seeing things happening or do you visualize things happening over there in terms of supply as well because if the markets were to really do well uh, over the next 20 30 years and in india indian financial markets have to really do well and more people come in uh, that supply also needs to be handled well so what are your perspectives and insights over there so interesting so historically if you look at let's say our primary market they will go go from extremely hot market to an extremely cold market there was nothing in between because money would come in chunks right i mean either there is lot of flood of money coming in and a large part of that was coming from foreign investors who will again be driven by many other considerations we didn't have the constant and and a very uh, uh, consistent supply of domestic capital that's where the 401k movement or india's sip movement comes in so if you have uh, now it's more than like 2 to 1/2 billion dollars a month of sip book and you add everything else whether it's the nps and the money that's in- invested by the insurance companies pension funds so on and so forth and the individual investors who do it directly if you put all of that together we're talking about like almost 30 40 billion dollars every year and which will grow because even now a very tiny fraction of the money comes to the comes to capital markets right from the overall if you look at the savings uh, or 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 the investment balance sheet of indian households or the incremental savings flow a percentage that comes is very small so we have a long way to go now with this kind of supply what will happen that primary markets will be either extremely hot to mildly hot to maybe maybe uh, in average but it won't go to extremely cold for next several year this is my expectation and um, there are so many businesses uh, which are at the cusp of like uh, if you can use the word like um, you know a jacob or or maybe a, a huge growth as as the economy goes from 2500 dollars to 3 4 5000 dollars in an economy which is 1.4 billion people uh, across variety of businesses um, and and given the capital market that we have over a period of time i think we are going to see like lot of businesses that get funded by the vcs and the private equity today will find like the exit environment or the exit ex- the exit uh, ecosystem so interesting and and, and so uh, uh, robust and and so thriving that that will also encourage a lot more investments in 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 vc and p right again i mean we we, we go through like uh, that funding winter to like another uh, exuberance but we won't have that right because there would be like a, a robust environment where consistently uh, like th- 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 there would be demand for for quality paper all the time that will give more confidence to to the early age investors also and then the monetization of assets right i mean a large part of economy still whether it's a real estate or all the infrastructure assets have not got financialized so we all talk about digitalization of finance we talk about financialization of savings but a big trend in in society and in our economy for next several years is financialization of assets 
financialization of assets. So assets get like, okay, somebody constructs it, somebody uh, is, is using that, but there are investors who are kind of owning that uh, asset at different points of, of their evolution. So I think that market again will become very, very large over a period of time. So, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, striking parallels between what happened in, in US in 80s, 90s, 2000s and, and us. The difference is, I think our policymakers are very prudent and very conservative. And I think that will, and also we have the history of the world to know that what happened in and let's say in several of these markets, what really didn't work for them. So how to ensure that we don't get into a subprime trouble and the CDOs and the CLOs, or let's say the Brady bonds before, or let's say uh, several of the other challenges that uh, the world has seen. So we can learn from them. Of course, we'll also have to go through our own maybe evolution at, at our stage. I mean, the classic Schumpeters that creative destruction, that's a, that's the nature of the beast. We will go through that. But I think uh, because of the conservative nature of our, our policymakers and the regulators and the ecosystem, I think we'll have the uh, correcting mechanism a uh, lot more robust, I, I assume that, and the feedback loop will be a lot more stronger. I think that's that's quite promising, and I think should that 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 only adds to the optimism of people listening to this. Uh, so thank you for sharing your thoughts there. Uh, uh, the next question uh, uh, is something which I have already asked uh, the other sane voices I have hosted on this uh, show. So Naren from ICICI, then Rajiv PPFS, and Kalpen, and sometime back Radhika as well. Uh, this is about index funds. Uh, and uh, we we all know that Buffett, someone like Buffett, who's who's quoted as saying that most investors, both institutional and in individual, will find that the best way to own common stocks is through a index fund that charges minimal fees. And uh, uh, he also mentioned that the people who follow this path are they're they're sure to beat the net results after fees and expenses delivered by a great majority of investment professionals. Now, from the other side of the table, as a creator and seller of mutual funds, what are your thoughts on index? investing which is widely prevalent in the western world but is yet to catch up in india and do you think index investing will be big in india in the future and if yes what needs to happen in the indian mutual fund industry to make that happen so everything will be big in india active managers will grow a lot more as just to give that that parallel of 1980 so as i said a fidelity or a capital would have been like few tens of billions of dollars are managing trillions of dollars. At the same time, you have the Vanguard and State Street and BlackRock and all of them who are also managing trillions of dollars. And then you have alternative firms who are also managing hundreds of billions of dollars. So the same thing will happen in India. All of us will grow. There is enough. I mean, large number of people are yet to meet the market and they'll be like, There'll be like many players who will make them meet the market. I think large number of those investors who would like to beat the market and they will have the product for them. Those who just want to meet the market will have the product for them. And and, and we'll, I think, uh, everything will, will, will grow in India. There are a few things you need to keep in mind. So when you look at that journey of US, I mean, credit again to our regulators as well as to the mutual fund industry together. I mean, the highly competitive nature of us and, 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 and a very transparent nature of us. In India, again, learning from the West, at very early stage, I think the fees got regulated in India, right? It is not regulated anywhere else in the world. It is not as transparent as uh, India anywhere else in the world. I mean, the way your direct plan and, 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 and a distributor plan, the way I think all the disclosures, the cap on the fee, the sliding structure, and then we removed the entry load in 2009. We have made it so transparent and because of the regulation as well as the market forces, the overall fee that an investor pays in an active fund today is, is I think it took 100 years for mutual fund industry in the US to reach that stage where we have reached, right? And the, the amount of money that you pay for an actively uh, managed fund includes both the alpha that a fund manager is generating and the service and the alpha that the distributor is providing you both is inbuilt right you are not paying anything in us the overlay of fee in many names would have been like so high for all these years that gave 
reason to people to kind of like look at passive which was a which was a lot cheaper and uh, and again I'm, i'm i'm like kind of saying that both will grow everything will will coexist in india and everything will grow maybe from a lower base passive may grow uh, uh, faster at a higher base but active will also grow alternatives because they're starting from a lower base they will also grow so everything will grow in india also to keep in mind i mean the track record that alpha managers have got like in hdfc we have funds which are like going back 30 years i mean you have seen many cycles many macro cycles market cycles business cycles profit cycles and um, economic and, and political cycles and in that period the consistent nature of of the uh, alpha creation by the managers and for variety of reasons one is that india is a stock picker's paradise always call it india is a stock picker's paradise the the variety of businesses which are which are listed and they are only going to go up the universe will become larger and larger and you put like the right kind of uh, philosophy and process and team and everything together there is still a lot of alpha to be captured over a period of time uh I've, Can I can I explain a little bit more on the active yes, management? Please. Yes, yes, please. How do you generate alpha? And it's a classic like Charles Ellis, the way he would explain. Like I mean, on one side, I was like deeply influenced by the Yale. Uh, they were the early ones to like really take a large bet on 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 the alpha creation, both by the alternative industry and some of the other alpha managers. And at the same time, the same person advocates so much about the index fund for a. for for other set of investors and it's it's very interesting so there are three sources i mean there are three ways of generating alpha right i mean or or, or the three kind of like major uh, sources number one you have an information edge you have an analytical edge and you have a behavioral edge right as a as a fund manager now information edge would have shrunk in one manner because there is like everything uh, so let's say as an institutional investor you get the same set of you know the, the results and everything at the same time as any other investor maybe in 80s and 90s that would have been different but at the same time i keep thinking that when there is so much of information it also creates a lot of noise right uh, how do you keep building your information edge in a manner that for example it's is physically exhausting right but it has also opened up many opportunities so you can do a lot much more channel checks today you can use the power of like let's say technology to to kind of like analyze it differently which is like the second edge you build the analytical edge uh, right tools right processes uh, right people so on and so forth but the most important is the behavioral edge right with more information and more data and and, and the more uh, it also creates more noise but data is not information information is not knowledge knowledge is not understanding understanding is not wisdom the wealth is created through wisdom and alpha is created through wisdom which is accumulated over a period of time so if you i keep building that you know that information edge analytical edge and and uh, behavioral edge you keep building as a as a team and the two big arbitrage that you have one is a time arbitrage because a large part of the market and we discussed about the fndo and variety of things right where you are like looking at next 30 minutes and we have a luxury of looking at a much longer time span right so that gives you a lot of opportunity to think differently than the market and the research arbitrage nobody wants to put that kind of uh, you know the resources and 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 the uh, talent to really get the research arbitrage if you keep refining these two constantly and keep building the the edge that uh, information analytical and uh, and the behavioral i still feel that there is there is lot of alpha to be captured over a period of time you need to get more more and more methodical and historically maybe uh, maybe the industry wasn't using as much technology or or let's say as much the computing prowess but that will again give us maybe a, a lot of other advantage over a period of time so if we can put a put a quant and attack overlay uh, on on the wisdom that you have built as as a stock picker or or as an analyzer of of business or macro and uh, with the technology you can keep uh, enhancing that so i actually feel uh, very positive about the potential of of active business and the more money we get in in passive funds i feel more positive about active right so in a market where information has got completely democratized and market has got completely institutionalized 
in that case, alpha becomes like a zero sum game, right? Because for everybody who's generating alpha, somebody else is, is losing. But the more money, if it is in passive, which again, I mean, for lack of a better word, I mean, no, I don't want to use that word because we are also selling a lot of passive funds and, and I feel positive about the potential of that growth also. But which is just replicating what is given to you and it has a certain momentum bias. Uh, that actually generates more opportunity for for active managers and some of the other things the more like in in us parlance if i use the more robin hood investors uh, the more algo and the technology and the program trading the more um, how do i say it like the more robo leverage in market or the more uh, like the psychological leverage in market created by the social media and, and the instant information on telegram and whatsapp all of this actually is enhancing the the alpha pool on the on the other side mm -hmm. i think uh, you as you rightly mentioned behavioral edge is i think the most important edge that you can get given the fact that there's so much noise and how do you get, get over that noise how do you separate a signal from noise and how do you analyze that situation better and also take a long term perspective i think that that's that's a real edge that uh, i think uh, so as, a, as an institutional large firm, what do you need to do that, right? So number one, I mean, a clarity of mandate, an investment philosophy, uh, which is very well articulated. You know what you do, uh, what you uh, are good at and what you are not good at and, 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 and the way the mandate is. And, and uh, you, you maintain the sanctity of, of that. Uh, the second thing you put in place is robust research. That's where I said that the the, the research arbitrage uh, in terms of both people, the tools and, and, and the processes that you put in place. The third is robust portfolio construction, the way you size up the portfolio uh, and, 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 and you ensure that it's, it's very robust and then you know you understand like how you create alpha. And last but not the least as an institutional, uh, player like putting the right risk management, governance, supervision, uh, constant feedback loop, which is that risk management, which is ingrained into the whole investment process and not an after the fact activity. The fund manager is doing something and then you analyze after a month, which is kind of like quite ingrained into it, which ensures that um, the the philosophy which is so well defined, you are you are managing in in in, in that manner, and and you. Keep building, keep enhancing, keep sharpening your your research arbitrage, and the behavioral arbitrage, which is mainly in the in the portfolio construction. In investing, we we we, we talk a lot about uh, the idea process versus outcome, and I think this is one of the most paramount <laughs> differences in ideas yeah. that I think investors uh, need to focus on. Now, of course, the outcome is important, but uh, that's we all know that's not in our control. And as an individual investor, I am in a good spot to not worry about that uh, a lot of yeah. time. But in running a mutual fund organization with investors and distributors often uh, rooting for a good outcome and often in the short run, how do you end up evaluating uh, your team, your fund managers, because the outcome is largely in their hands? How do you walk this line between process versus outcome in your organization? No, of course, I, th I think it's a, it's a classic that skill versus uh, luck, the, the, the role of luck versus the skill set that you have put in place. And the most important uh, thing that we look for in people, of course, I mean, there are there are ways to kind of like evaluate everyone. You, you look at performance against the bench, look at performance against the peers across time period, so on and so forth. Most important thing for me is, I think the people who do well over a period of time are the ones who have, and, and generally, I mean, talent is kind of like given, right? Your, your process would be such and markets are ruthless. I mean, uh, this industry is like, for lack of a better word, like brutal. I mean, it'll only, it'll ensure that only the great survive, the good will keep kind of like getting flushed out. It, it's so ruthless, right? Because we are like, our, our NAV is out daily. <laughs> I mean, uh, and, and, and you can you, you can see the portfolio on a monthly basis and you can analyze anyone. So that the, the skill set can be kind of like analyzed on a daily basis. Uh, 
and the people who do well over a period of time and and we would constantly support them are the ones who are driven by a deep sense of purpose uh, we would have the best of the tools will they will be supported by best of the people best of the environment we will give them that space where where they can thrive over a long period uh, and and won't have that constant short term pressure to ensure that that alpha is generated uh, when we say consistency it, it means like consistency over a longer period or over a longer time frame not like day after day month after month quarter after quarter and year after year if you are delivering that then you are a good trader not a good fund manager there is a very interesting i'm just digressing for a minute before i come back joel green i think it's joel green plat study or that very interesting study of thousands of funds over a 10 year period where the best funds would have would have been in like bottom to quartiles at least two or three years uh, 90% of that i mean 90% probability that for over a 10 year period for two or three years they would have been in bottom to quartiles 60 70% probability that they would have been in bottom quartile for two or three years over a 10 year period the best fund managers uh, who have delivered best over a 10 year period and uh, i think 47% probability that they would have been bottom decile over a two or three year period two or three different uh, uh, years so long term orientation is is important the most important thing that we look for and and i think this is my view the people who thrive are the ones who have a deep sense of purpose this is one of the most noble profession in the world you are dealing with somebody else's money and the deep sense of trusteeship the deep sense of responsibility i think if you are driven by that a lot of other things get taken care of as i said i mean i'm not kind of belittling the other part because if you don't have the talent if you don't have the uh, investing framework if you don't have the right process nothing will work but if you don't have this like as as buffett said in a, in a different way that i look for what intelligence uh, energy and integrity if you don't have the last one then the other don't bother about the first two similarly of course you need to have that integrity and and ethics also but a larger Uh, i would say in, in, in a more comprehensive manner that you need to have the deep sense of purpose you are here to make uh, money for for other people and it's a it's a very very noble profession so maybe i don't know whether you were looking for that answer when you asked me that how do you like really evaluate and shift the luck versus skill there are so many tools these days grown to get into the whole quant knowledge uh, i mean uh, see if i followed all of these people and i can talk about all the attribution <laughs> analysis and all of that but i think that's that's important we do that uh, for a living uh, we analyze that all the time but i this is my very very strong view and 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 a message to all the people who are in this industry and who are going to come uh, into this industry must keep this in mind no i completely agree uh, on that part about the nobility of the profession which not many people agree and appreciate or give like give the gratitude to uh, i remember uh, uh, in 2000 during 2003 2008 uh, when i was <coughs> starting when i was working on my job and was uh, uh, because of restrictions uh, in my company uh, uh, on the stocks which i was analyzing so i was not allowed we were not allowed to buy the shares that because we were research analyst right so the, all my savings largely went to mutual funds and sips and everything and thanks to the market and thanks to the good money managers and in fact hdfc was where i started my uh, mutual funds and i kept on for the first uh, 8 years while working on the job uh, that helped me the money the wealth that hdfc and the money the wealth that my sips thanks to the good mutual funds uh, uh, i believed in created that helped me pay off my liability and that ultimately led me to quit my job and do what i am doing today so all thanks to you uh, since you're talking about no, that all like- to the industry right uh, you talked about the sense of purpose which is such all a honest, deep there are people that uh, while we can take credit for how well we have done and funds have got 30 year track record several of the funds 25 year 20 year track record and we can take credit for many things our our, our people our, our processes our philosophy uh, the platform and everything but i think maybe it's it's a deep sense of purpose uh, that has that has probably contributed the most to to this performance and and we have set a mission for ourselves to be the wealth creator for every indian to be the wealth creator for every indian and i think that that noble purpose kind of like helps us yeah i think that's a great sense of purpose uh, navneet uh, thanks for talking about that uh, 
I, in fact, my next question was something related to this. So uh, I, I am sure uh, uh, leading a money management firm, there are a lot of pressures you talked about. Uh, it's a brutal system, brutal world out there. Your daily NAVs are published and uh, it's, it's, it's largely uh, sometimes it happens that you may be you may end up focusing on the outcomes uh, in the short run. Uh, uh, but I think uh, 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 so my question around that is that uh, while continuing to go through this uh, uh, brutal world and through this uh, uh, pre these pressures all around uh, and also enjoy what you are doing right so what is your support system apart from the purpose where do you find support uh, so of course there, there, there is uh, this is this is an industry which keeps you on your toes every day and there are many changes it's hyper competitive there are more than 45 players and like some of the uh, some of the other places and uh, you cannot be kind of like get complacent at any point in time you have to be on your toes all the time and there are many changes that are that are happening and you constantly need to evolve constantly need to reorient re-engineer yourself but the fundamental tenets of like investing don't change fundamental tenets are the, the, the building blocks of like building this business they, they don't change over a period of time and i said what what keeps you motivated is like i think this deep sense of purpose as i said that uh, just just like two three years back we, we we thought like what should be our mission and when then and we said that to be the wealth creator for every indian so we'll grow from three trillion dollar economy that time i think industry had like 25 million or so two two and a half crore investors over the next several years i think we have a long journey ahead our markets will grow to four trillion five ten twenty trillion dollar uh, dollars of, of market size of, of economy size and millions of households that we can reach out to to spread that uh, that growth and to 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 distribute the fruit of that growth uh, to share the fruits of that growth with many more households i think that's something that that kind of like makes you feel very excited uh, every single single day in Warren Buffett's but i tap dance to work uh, we are an organization with like wonderful people uh, uh, many who've been with us for long the many who have joined recently the many youngsters who are who are coming and and i feel like so good to be at work every day we also put a put a vision and it may sound like very audacious to you vishal uh, we have put a vision for ourselves a passion i can say which is to be the most respected asset manager in the world in the world last three words and why is that i i give you that parallel of let's say several asset managers in us who were in 80s managing maybe tens of billions of dollars and then they end up uh, you know they, they, then they move to managing hundreds of billions of dollars and some of them are managing trillions of dollars today and india would be similar right and in, in, in our life we are going to see a country which is as large in terms of size of economy and market cap as let's say a us in the next 25 30 years so definitely there would be asset managers who would be very large but the joy won't be that you become one of the larger uh, player in asia or in in, in in the world but how can we be the most respected and for that you have to really pursue excellence every single day in every possible uh, way and, and earn the respect of every stakeholder, uh, not only your shareholder or your unit holders, or your partners, your people, the ecosystem, society, regulators, everybody. And uh, yeah, so that that's a support system. I don't know whether uh, I answered your question. <laughs> I think uh, you did right. Uh, you talked about the audacity of the goal, right? But I think uh, yeah. you're leading uh, from the front. I think uh, it should become a reality sooner than later. So wish you all the best and your team all the best for that. Thank uh, you. And and I I get that energy from from all our people every day. Looking back, looking back at your own journey, Navneet, over the past uh, uh, thirty years, being in the finance industry and also being an investor, I'm sure. What's one piece of advice you wish you could have given yourself, your younger self, when you were just starting out in the world of finance and investing? You know, it's interesting. I told you that I got interested in market at very early age, like at the age of 11. But uh, I didn't understand like how to really create wealth and, and, and have this whole power of compounding 
uh, I think that came much, much uh, 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 later and we were just kind of like analyzing market and, and be with it. Maybe uh, today, I mean, when I meet youngsters, I, I tell them that think about your retirement at early age and the difference that it can make when you start investing in a disciplined manner in your 20s and then 30s and, and so on and so forth. Um uh, but but as I said that the bigger joy for me always has been like, you know, creating wealth for other people. And that I think I've got so lucky and so blessed to be to be part of this industry where you got that opportunity. That's wonderful. Now I have I've not interacted with you uh, a lot in the past, though it doesn't feel like after talking to you today. So thanks for the kindness uh, that you're showing. But yeah, somehow absolutely. I believe that uh, you are a highly spiritual person and you talked, you hinted at some spirituality earlier in this uh, conversation. What according to, uh, or what does spirituality really mean to you and how how uh, does it play a role in the life of a modern day thinker, decision maker and investor uh, as per your experience? The whole earth is a, what is that called? Pale blue dot. <laughs> yes, the pale blue dot. <laughs> In the universe, how yes. small we are, how small we are. And uh, but at the same time, on one side, like how small we are uh, in the whole universe. And let's say our, our Earth is so tiny, you know, as I like blue dot in the galaxy. And then there are like, I don't know, trillions of, of that. I mean, of, and the whole universe is so big. But on the other side, we are the universe, right? I mean, we are the manifestation of everything that has happened in the universe so far and everything that will happen uh, after us uh, since time immemorial and for like the uh, next time immemorial. So if you look at our seeds, I mean, how we were born and, and the whole nature and the whole universe would have kind of like walked towards, towards it. And we are the reservoir or, or that one uh, miniature of the entire universe. So how powerful and how big we are, how giant we are. And as I said that, like maybe uh, not able to articulate that well, but so we are very tiny and we are like the whole universe, both. And if you look at that duality, both and, and, and going back to like say many things from, I, mean, I would have learned, uh, let's say Mahavira, as he said, he says that, Appa so parimappa, atma hi paramatma hai. I mean, every soul has the potential to be the super soul. I mean, if you like have the some Gyan, some Magdarshan, some Magcharitra, some Magtap and all of that, or the way Buddha would have said that uh, uh, his, his path in, in Dhammapad or a, anything that you read, I mean, in, in, in Bhagavad Gita, that uh, once you surrender yourself to that larger force and believe that I'm part of this universe, universe, I mean, there, there is a reason that you you exist and there is a purpose behind it. And then you live for, for that purpose and surrender yourself to that larger force, whether you call it anything, uh, a super intelligence or a cosmic power or God or Lord or whatever. Uh, I, I don't think the name really, really, or, or the description really matters, but you are part of that, that wider or, or a larger force for which you are here. Once you do that, and then I think the, um, just knowing yourself, the self-realization and, and the, I mean, the whole journey of self-contemplation and the self-realization, it, it becomes very different than, than I think if you, if you don't think on those lines, yeah. And I, I'm sure you were also a student of Indian spirituality, uh, uh, the Eastern spirituality that you talked about, uh, which uh, across uh, whether you talk Buddhism or Jainism or Hinduism, uh, we all emphasize the ideas of mindfulness, the ideas of patience, the idea of detachment from the outcome, which are, I think, all applicable in being an investor or a money manager. Uh, so be, now being uh, both a student of spirituality well, and, 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 and Vishal, you were discussing about this whole process versus the outcome, right? I mean... Process versus outcome, that's what like whole Gita is about, right? And and if you go to the next level in Astavakra or, or in Vashishti Yoga and some of the other things, the only thing is in your whatever, what you can do is, is the process. Outcome is always uh, not in, 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 in your control. But our, our job is to kind of like constantly work on, on that process. That's right. And not worry about the outcome. So yeah, I think absolutely such so so well applicable. Uh, uh, 
uh, you, you know, our, our, our society historically, I mean, you always go back and, and the way we have thought, it's so different. And that's why I said that why I feel so positive about India's growth model versus anybody else. Um, because we always believed in Vasudhaev Kutumkam. The whole planet is my family. People are my family. Uh, we always believed in like, Bahujan Hitai, Bahujan Sukhai. This is how, let's say, Tata Group and let's say an SDFC group and many of the groups that we, 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 we exist because of the society and, and then uh, the good of, of many and, 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 uh, uh, for like always thinking about about all stakeholders uh, our, our, our whole philosophy if you look at is like not thinking of finite but why zero got invented here because we were in the search of infinite um, when you divide the number with zero then only you get the infinite and and that's why maybe we were so different than any other society in the world well, that's a fascinating point of view. Uh, I mean, you, we, we are the only one where people always sought like uh, happiness in, in this life. And in our case, it is like uh, Asatoma Sadgame, Tamsoma Jyotirgame, Mrityorma Amritgame, because we, we always thought of immortality. This life is like just way too short in the whole like uh, long arc of things, or, or, or in, 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 when you look at the time of space, how small you are but at the same time you can be immortal because you are the universe and brahmasmi also <laughs> i think rightly said like uh, 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 appreciating the insignificance uh, things that we are and at the same time the significance of our lives right the it's entire both. universe inside us i think <laughs> the duality is such a duality an of that anicca everything is anitya and on the other thing is like but you are part of the nitya you are nitya and once you understand that, that this is mortal, the body that is talking to you is mortal, but the larger purpose of this body is like, or maybe I'm immortal because I'm nature, I'm universe <laughs> and beyond. I'm sure, I'm sure. Now, you've, you've, you've been in this market, you've, you've walked a long journey uh, from, from Biawar to Bombay and uh, over the last 30, 30 40 years. Uh, uh, I'm sure it, it must not have been a bed of roses altogether. There must have been some setbacks that you would have faced. So going back, if you can remember, what's that biggest setback you've ever faced in your career or life and how did you overcome that? Not that something comes to mind. I think everything happens for a reason. Uh, who's put that the best way? I think that is it Steve Jobs that you can only connect dots uh, forward and, and not... The, sorry, you can only connect dots backward and not forward so i think everything would have happened for a for a reason there must have been like uh, a celestial design or or the universe wanted it to happen at that point in time uh maybe thinking about like ray dalio like um, you know the progress is all about pain plus reflection pain plus reflection equal to progress that that pain is is for a certain reason and you constantly reflect and then kind of uh, move on. So I don't see anything as like a major, really? I mean, there would have been challenges, many challenges. Um, as I said, that come from that place and, 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 and all kinds of constraints. But uh, the other way to look at it, how rich an environment from a value system perspective and uh, how, how rich an environment from, let's say, getting that curiosity uh, and then in life and then uh, then yeah the the kind of i've been so lucky in life i've been so lucky in in, in all ways so i don't think anything i would put it as a setback <laughs> right right so we're living uh, i'm sure you agree we're living right. in a yes, world we, we talked about all the indian philosophy and then setback um, i've been very fascinated by marcus aurelius meditations that book i mean a small book which he wrote as like diary and notes to himself which got kind of like published and uh, i mean the, the guy was like in war constantly and look at the reflections that he had and and the world view and you are an emperor and 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 uh, I mean, it's, it's so fascinating. <laughs> I think the more you read uh, the, all these philosophies, the more you find the sameness, the equality or the lessons that are that are thought through all these philosophies, whether the Western ones, Stoicism or ancient yeah. Indian ones or Eastern ones. I think uh, the idea is to find that middle ground. The idea is to find that commonality. And I think that is how we create the purpose of our lives or the 
uh, journeys that we walk upon uh, and the, the most important about the whole indian philosophy is like like mavera says apna sacha message ja, that each one has to find its own truth और इवन दी बुद्धा राइट आई मीन दुख है दुख का कारण है उसका निवारण है उसकी प्रक्रिया बट यू हैव टू फाइंड आई कैन नॉट काइंड ऑफ लाइक आई कैन गाइड यू ऑन दैट पाथ बट यू हैव टू फाइंड योर ओन ओन ट्रूथ और लेट्स द होल महाभारत एंड एवरीथिंग विच लाइक ट्रूथ इज कंटेक्चुअल और द धर्मा लाइक देर इज नो लाइक वन रिजिड डेफिनेशन ऑफ ऑफ इट एंड यू हैव टू फाइंड यू हैव टू काइंड ऑफ गो थ्रू go through that cycle and that's why when you asked about the setbacks i mean i wouldn't look at it like a like a setbacks because uh, maybe yeah the, the the universe had to take you through that just right maybe just as stepping stones and not more than yeah. that yeah right uh, so we are living in a world uh, uh, which is changing rapidly and it's always been the case but i think the change has just just multiplied uh but uh, uh given that that you also talk to a lot of young people college students uh, right uh, we also understand that uh, uh, a formal education system uh, often seems insufficient to teach all that is required to thrive uh, in this ever changing world so given this uh, uh, background what advice uh, do you offer uh, or would you offer to your to students and young adults in self educating themselves and what are some of the key work and life skills uh, you think uh, they should learn Uh, to do well in the next uh, few decades maybe some of the things that we might have discussed i think that sense of curiosity uh, i mean just using the sentence my father i read more meet more uh, have genuine interest in like learning you have to learn every day um, either you are growing or or you are degrowing there is nothing in between there is nothing like a standstill uh, you have to constantly keep learning keep on learning and and working towards that the world is changing at a much faster pace than than let's say past and i mean the ai i think is is a very big force i think that the whole technological revolution that we have seen uh, and now we are reaching a stage which is like maybe that Uh, a manufacturing revolution or the agricultural revolution that we had we changed humanity in many ways uh, very very like distinct paradigm shift for lack of better words these are the standard words that we use i think maybe something bigger than that and maybe with technology and now with the ai i think we are we are reaching that stage which is like as powerful as the industrial revolution that we had which will change society in a, in a in a very meaningful manner and that's why it's very important that we constantly keep learning and and keep evolving larger i think sense of purpose that i think in many ways we would have we would have discussed that uh, our life has a certain purpose and and constantly ensuring that uh, we live life which has a which has a purpose i'm deeply inspired by gandhi i mean what a man and and as einstein said that future generation won't believe that someone like him ever lived in 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 flesh and blood um that there, there, there is so much to to learn from some of these people uh, and if you do that then rest of the things kind of just just fall in place you talked about gandhi uh, 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 anyone that you can think of or any ancient uh, person uh, that you can think of that has inspired you the most in life i think as i said from the from the western philosophy i mean the whole uh, stoic philosophy but marcus aurelius i think that that meditations of 100 pages it just i think credible uh, of how much of wisdom is there in those whatever 80 100 120 it's just unbelievable and of course the whole uh, india is so deep i think as i said that why we invented zero because i think we were looking at infinite uh, we were going from finite to infinite and and i think our our the the indian and then my view in next 20 30 years why i feel so positive on india that uh, the 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 science we, we are in a world where it is going to be like we are going to see the best of science and best of spirituality and that's where i think india india lies that's what we are uh through spirituality we were at the cutting edge of science and because of the science we were at the cutting edge of of spirituality because we understood our our body at a level which i think the world hasn't reached we looked at our our soul or whatever you call it at a level where the world hasn't reached or many societies haven't reached and i think that's why we have so much to offer to the to the world that's great uh uh you talked about the importance of hard work uh, navneet uh, and i'm sure uh, uh, hard work uh, with hard work you also need to form the right kind of habits uh, and work on those habits over time 
so uh, if i were to ask you what is that one habit that you that you say uh, which has most positively impacted your life over the last few years i think interest in people uh, in general uh, i've always said that uh, there are many ways of like uh, uh, learning like one is that you read and then like mangar said that you can benefit so much and in those few hundred pages learning from the entire uh, lifelong learning of someone uh, so that helps but i think also observing and just kind of like being interested in in people at all points in time from different walks of life and and not miss that opportunity of of understanding like what drives people and and what kind of motivates them what doesn't make them happy what makes them happy uh, a general interest in, in in people uh i think that that's a that's a great source of learning and and i think it's a, it's underappreciated also i think the uh and, and and several times i keep thinking that am i introvert am i extrovert because i'm always in in, in public and uh, given the job that that i am in and and and, and the natural instinct but i love solitude as much i mean that's uh so that that makes me feel at times like am i like very introvert but at the same time like extrovert and both have its own own place not so good i guess back and a uh, not so good habit i think i i never played uh, sport like really seriously and and could become good at that i don't think i do enough for to to remain fit the way one should be <laughs> yeah i've been improving a little bit but not much yeah which is not i think but that's also the way buffett lives his life right you just tap right. dancing to work i think that's good enough exercise for you <laughs> <laughs> no but, but but i mean a lot of people who are so disciplined and maybe i i need to manage that better yeah i think just realizing that we we still need to improve in a lot of areas of our life i think is that's a good good start <laughs> that's great yeah. uh, talking about reading navneet you you're a voracious reader uh, with a deep understanding of economics finance history and i'm sure a lot of other things given your super busy schedule how do you manage to find time to read and think and uh, second question is uh, uh, which is the best book you read uh, ever apart from uh, meditation that you talked about which is your most favorite book of all time First is how do you find time to read? Because most people cannot take out time. <laughs> well, you, you. you are right. I think yeah, I don't read as much as I should be reading. And uh, 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 you know, first of all, I mean, we are so blessed. We are so lucky. We get paid for what reading, writing, speaking. I mean, it's a, like a dream job. You get paid for reading, writing, uh, speaking um, as, as a fund manager uh, all your life. I don't. I don't read as much as I should be reading. First of all, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I try to read, and and maybe I I give a lot of books to a lot of people all the time. Every day there would be like a couple of books that I would be giving to people, and that I mean, my anti library or anti library. I don't know how to pronounce it. What the Sim Talib says that keeps increasing because of that, and we have to constantly think about what to give and what to kind of like keep at home, which which is for my my house. It looks like a Radhi ka dukan. Uh, which is like the books all around like there there's a very little space and i'm still not used to kindle or anything i i like the smell of the book uh, so it's it's all over do i read all of them and i read way tiny fraction of that how do i get time actually not much i just kind of keep so many in my like bedroom or wherever i sit even in my office at office of course you don't get any time to to read that but yeah i just pick up something and then yeah it excites you then you go through a few pages flight is a good time i travel like uh, and i travel regularly every week in fact in few minutes i'll be catching a flight so maybe that will give me some time also i i, I realize i mean one is the is the reading books but also maybe i i use a flight time to just kind of do nothing and and being still in in, in meditation so that also kind of the time for the reflection as much yeah but but to to be very honest vishal uh, when i when i look around and and i see people like you get very inspired that uh, uh, need need to read a lot more than what i do but i just got like as i said that since childhood because my father inculcated that uh, habit in me i had the opportunity to read uh, so much over the years but but way tiny than than what i should have read or i should be reading and, and the world is changing so much there is so much to read 
I think you use the right term anti library so this is what you see behind me as well so uh, <laughs> to be very frank it's a very tiny fraction of what I have read uh, yeah. and uh, the more books I uh, have in my background it also means that there's so many things that I yet to learn right so I think this yeah. is how this is we all sitting in the same booth yes yeah. this is sitting yeah. in the same how booth. little we know how little that we know that is so true that is true but but I I keep thinking I mean our, our, our life is so short. I mean, you know that that Seneca shortness of of life. So, but that keeps you motivated for everything, right? You need to read so much. You need to do this. You need to do this. But at the same time, that I mean, the life is immortal. Maybe there is something. The anti library probably helps us in at some other stage. Maybe a few hundred years later or a few thousand years later, it'll it'll help us in some manner. That's why the anti library should be very big. <laughs> Sure. Bigger the better. Uh, you have kids, Navneet? Yeah, my okay. yeah, I have a daughter who got married uh, yeah, two years back and then I have a son. Yeah. Great. So uh, any advice that you would want to offer them on life and living? Maybe one big advice that you would want to offer your children on life and living? So on a relative basis, when I look at my friends and other people, I think I didn't spend as much time with them because I just loved my work so much and would have worked like most of the weekends throughout my career. But I always believe this and, and, and I don't think that it's about guilt because I've heard some of the people like, uh, who who always loved their work freedom is the best expression of love freedom is the best expression of love and and got so lucky that these beautiful kids they did everything on their own i didn't have to devote uh, as much time on some of the things that i see parents devoting and i was extremely lucky that i had a wife who's like homemaker and dedicated her life to kind of like kind of help me in whatever I can do and, and dedicated her life to to make the kids what what they have become. So from the value system, as I said, for, for generations, we always believed, I mean, our, our life is, human life has three purposes. I mean, the, 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 there is a saint, I mean, Swami Shananji, uh, he, he, he was like visually impaired, but I haven't read anyone who's like probably got as much wisdom as as he had uh, and uh, so in, in one of the bhajan he says that jakki seva khoj apni preeti unse ki i mean human life has only three purposes i mean jakki seva because we, we have been like as i said we are a miniature of the whole universe we, we uh, every minute that we live is because of like many many other forces from nature and other people so we have to return that so jakki seva and a khoj apni is like constantly you have to have to uh, uh, know yourself and preeti unse ki jiye. so just love that force that has that has made you this uh, this is what i try to kind of like tell them both of them are uh, to i mean i would say that you yeah, are in a direction where my, my daughter works in a in a development agency in, in in brussels it's a german development agency she's working on smart cities in, in africa and has a deep sense of purpose that um, i mean as i said there was so that kutum come several times i think that this is this is the time when when should be in India, of course, and, and I'm sure she would be at some stage, but yeah, helping helping the world. So she spent a lot of time in Africa. Son is like doing design engineering and, and happy that with that learning in Imperial College and, and design engineering would be able to solve something which will be helpful to humanity going forward. So happy to know that. Uh, uh, we, we're nearing the end of this conversation and I have just two, three questions for you, uh, Namnita. Uh, uh, the first is, uh, uh, what is the single best piece of advice you ever got? And a related question, what is the single worst piece of advice you ever got, which in hindsight was a bad advice? So if you can remember anything over there. There are many. I've been blessed. Like the people I've worked with uh, all my life have been so outstanding uh, every single day, kind of like learned so much and I'm so much in gratitude uh, to to them. I mean, I started with like my, what my grandfather said that, wo pata nahi kiski se ghar chalta hai. like ensure that everybody gets taken care of. It's not because of you for sure. It's it's about because of the other people. So take care of everyone. My father who said that read more, meet more, always remember this. He used to say that read more and meet more. Uh, every person teaches you something. So don't take it like you have time lagana because you don't know what insight you will you will get from uh, from from any person or what what worldly wisdom that you will get from from that and many people over the years I was like as I told you I came from like small town to to like a 
professional firm and then we had you know a jv with capital international uh, of course i worked in the holding company for a couple of years was was deeply involved in all businesses and financial services and from all of those people learned so much i was quite involved in cfa society for almost two decades now as a volunteer and that again gave me a lot of opportunity both in india and globally outstanding investors outstanding leaders outstanding thinkers academicians uh, throughout the world I had the opportunity to interact with them and each one of them several of them I had the privilege of of interviewing them moderating their sessions uh, speaking there uh, would have learned like so much from everyone so yeah <laughs> Bad advice? I don't know. Uh, no, nobody. I think everyone, everyone, be kind to yourself. Somebody says that, like you know, uh, not Seneca. Who's that? Like, be kind to people. You don't know what they are going through. I'm sure. I mean, there's there's no like bad advice. Uh, you know, there, there's Swami Shanana Ji. He says that you don't. आप भले नहीं आप भलाई करके भले नहीं बनते हो. आप भले बन जाओगे तो भलाई हो जाएगी. I don't know whether I'm able to express it well that. आप बुराई रहित हो जाओ तो आप भले बन जाओगे आप जब भले बन जाओगे तो आपसे भलाई होएगी पीपल थिंक दैट अच्छा करो तो अच्छे बन जाएंगे ऐसा नहीं होता है मतलब ही सेज दैट कर्ता से कर्म निकलता है सो so, पहले आप पहले अच्छे बन जाओ भले बन जाओ तो भलाई अपने आप होने लग जाएगी अच्छा अपने आप होने लग जाएगा एंड वो कैसे होगा उसका एक ही तरीका है बुराई रहित हो जाओ नॉट दैट आई बिकम आई मीन सो मच बुराई विच आर लाइक पार्ट ऑफ इंस्टिंग बट कॉन्स्टेंटली कीप थिंकिंग कि मैं बुराई रहित हो जाऊंगा तो मैं भला बन जाऊंगा मैं भला बन जाऊंगा तो मेरे से अपने आप भलाई होगी आई मीन दिस लाइक सो प्रोफाउंड दैट आपकी बुराई रहित हो जाओ जब वो गूगल कह रहे डोंट बी एवल वॉट इज दैट डोंट बी एवल नो समथिंग लाइक दैट Uh, That's the idea of inversion that we talk about, right? Uh, instead of yeah, knowing yeah. what to do, know what to avoid. So I think that's a great insight. Uh, in a parallel universe, uh, would you still be in finance or doing something else? If not finance, what else you would have been doing? I said that universe has a design. There is a reason I'm 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 here and I'm doing this. But even in finance, like you are in many things. Uh, th- this is a good industry, and I think that. you need to earn a lot of karma to be here where you get an ability to impact lives of large number of people and i'm not talking about only about the people who who kind of like are are, are working with us the shareholders for whom we generate value uh, for for our our, our vendors or, or all our our investors and and you are you have an ability to kind of like impact lives so it's it's, it's such an amazingly beautiful beautiful profession and then as i said that we get paid for reading writing speaking so i don't know what better it could have been yeah <laughs> maybe a philosopher if there was no finance industry but but, but if you are not a i, I won't say good philosopher i'm not a philosopher i think all is a borrowed knowledge but if you are not a if you don't understand this philosophy you won't really be a good fund manager or you won't be a good wealth creator for sure they, they if you read like even the western philosophy the adam smith or keynes or anybody they were all students of philosophy and that's how they became the economist or that's how uh, they became i mean the whole homo economicus and and if you go back into the history and the, the foundation is in philosophy foundation of everything is philosophy now need my last question is uh, uh, that everyone walks on their own journey of life and everyone must play their parts well but what according to you is a life well lived i think a life of purpose yeah a life of of purpose and 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 constantly thinking that it's it's not about you on one side you don't have the ego and the uh, and this whole thinking about from a from a like a narrow self perspective but you are the universe you're so powerful and you are so big and you are you are part of something much bigger than that what we can think as a as a narrow individual life human life i mean smavira says uh, in in uttaradhyan that chatari parmam gaani dullahani hai jantuno manu sattam sui sadda sanj mammi aviryam the four things are are bahut durlabh hai four things are like very difficult to get together first the human life and think about it if we were like any other animal what life would have been the human life makes it so different 
uh, sui, uh, sui is like the, the Shastra, which can, any manner, it's not about the scriptures as such, your ability to kind of like, you know, get access to, to learning and thinking and contemplating and meditating on that. Uh, Shraddha, you have the, the Shraddha on that, uh, you have the faith that, yeah, human life is, is uh, valuable and invaluable. Then you have the respect for that learning and the wisdom. Uh, you have the the respect for that, and the Sanjumami Avirium, which is like the the Sayyame Parakram, which is like you have to put all of that into your life, right? I mean, the way you live has to be like that. The human life. I mean, there is uh, there is a purpose behind that. You got that. Uh, and there are trillions of creature, trillions raised to power, trillions probably. Uh, which is human brain cannot cannot process large numbers. We think very linearly. So every nanosecond, <laughs> trillions raised to power, trillions get born and die. But you have a human life. You get you know the access to this learning and wisdom. If you have the the shraddha towards it, and then you can live life accordingly. These four are like very uh, very difficult to get all of four of them. But those who get it, that's what the that's why. I mean, they, they are the ones who are the uh, kind of, you got the salvation or the nirvana. Uh, and which is like, yeah, I mean, we, we have been so lucky that we were born in this land where we got this. We were at the right time in, in the right industry. And, and all of these things have like just fallen in place. I'm sure I think uh, when you talk about the sense of purpose, I'm reminded of what Jason Zweig asked Charlie Munger a few years back of what uh, he would want to get written on his uh, grave. And he said uh, a, a statement which read, uh, I try to be useful. Right. Oh, so, uh, I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. so I think, uh, uh, Navneet, you've been useful to, I think, a millions, millions and millions of investors out there through your work, uh, through your career over the years. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart uh, for that. And uh, thank you for sharing all your insights that you've done today. Uh, it's been a fascinating uh, two hour plus conversation for me with all the breaks and everything. So uh, sorry for that. And thank you so much for being the kind of person that you are. No, thank you so much, Vishal. Uh, from the bottom of my heart, I don't know whether I mean, I ever had some of these conversations, but yeah, I truly enjoyed every second of it. And of course, not that I have like much wisdom to, to share, but I mean, you could spend like two and a half hours and found it interesting that itself is like yeah, my, my deepest gratitude to you. My pleasure, uh, Navneet. Thank you so much. And if I, I mean, any manner like hurt you or anybody who listens to it, I'm like really sorry. <laughs> You've been very, very kind. And thank you for that as well. You've been very, very kind. Thank you.